A king must have a kingdom. A king implies rulership, reigning. And in the text, Ephesians 1 and 6, it says he made us a kingdom and priests. There's no need to have a king unless you have a kingdom. And the whole point of a priest is to serve God and serve the people of God. And so he's the ruler of kings. That's why the text says he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Our job is to serve and to present God and his love to people. And so he's elected us for that task. And if you look at the language here in Ephesians, it is the language of royalty. That's why your handout speaks to the whole point that Ephesians focuses on the royal power of the church. The church is the very pillar and ground of the truth of God. The church is the bride of Christ. And so this book really speaks to the nature and purpose of the church, that he is the head, we are his body, and he wants us to function as his royal body on this earth to point people to him. And therefore, we have great responsibility and with that great accountability. This type of royalty, this type of rulership is not without great responsibility and accountability. And that's why that slide speaks to enlightenment, speaks to light. He wants us to clarify and see things as they are. What do you mean? Uh, Just because you don't necessarily have the revelation of what things are does not mean they're not there, meaning that God is interested in you looking telescopically. Um, I'm reminded of some of the science and physics classes many, many years ago. They talked about the atmosphere and the stratosphere and the ionosphere. There are different levels of kingdom, so to speak, and each one is higher. So he's expecting you and I to scale the heights of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And that's what he's praying for. That is Paul when he wrote the book of Ephesians. Needless to say, he had that kind of telescopic view because he was physically in a Roman prison. But yet he's encouraging the people of God that are outside of a prison. And even said to Timothy when he was talking to him, he says, I'm in bonds, but... The word of God is not bound. And so you are not bound the more you reflect upon the power of the word of God. And so when we talk about spiritual riches, we talked a lot about the position and the stand that we are supposed to have as blood-bought and blood-washed believers. Why are we to possess and take what God has positioned us for? Because Jesus died and he rose again. And he expects a certain kind of thinking and therefore a certain kind of behavior from the people who understand what that death, burial, and resurrection means on a practical day-to-day basis. I guess you could say it illustratively. Why, Why would you have a bicycle if you don't ride it? Why would you have a car if you don't drive it? Why would you have money if you don't spend it? Why would you have health if you don't enjoy it? Why would you have spiritual resources if you don't use them? God is saying you are supposed to appropriate the very resources that he bled, suffered, and died for, and rose from the dead for with all power and authority in him. And then he then said, now you go into all the world. And as you go, go and demonstrate this life that I've given to you. I've come that you might have life, life to the full, an abundant life. Say amen. 
And so your handout speaks to the whole idea of apprehending what we already have. This is just a brief review. And I gave examples of, so that you wouldn't get embroiled in these terms as if uh, they sound like fancy phrases when they're not. When I say possess our position, practically speaking, Joshua had to possess or take Canaan. We talked about that. Gideon had to possess and take the Midianite army. And we must take possession of our souls. Uh, in Luke chapter 21, 19, he says, possess ye your soul. That means you must learn to express and demonstrate this new life on the inside of you in a practical way. And you do it by forming, as Philippians 2 and 5 talks about, the mind of Christ, the attitude of Christ, no longer being satisfied with milk, but with meat. Say amen. No longer being ignorant to how God has rebirthed you. And what does that rebirthing mean in a practical basis, on a practical basis? Here's one I want you to really pay attention to, no longer blaming the devil or other people when it actually may be the result of your own undisciplined life. 